Good morning. We are going to get started with our media availabilities for this weekend's Food City 500 at Bristol Motor Speedway. Uh, we're kicking off the day with Kurt Busch, the driver of the number 41 Haas Automation Monster Energy Ford. Kurt, you've had a bit of success here at Bristol. You and your brother are tied for most wins among active drivers with five wins at Bristol. Um, just talk about coming back here to some place where you've been so successful and uh, maybe looking forward to breaking that tie with Kyle. Yeah, I always look forward to coming to Bristol with the atmosphere, the way the track's designed, uh, the way that the, the intimate setting is so cool for the fans. Um, you know, just the, the fact there's no garage area here. We work out on pit road. Uh, there's so many little small things that are fun and unique about Bristol. And then the race itself um, with the, the pitch strategy and, and how the tires play out and uh, the low lane versus the high lane. There's so many different things you always have to adjust to and, uh, and, then, and then roll with how things are unfolding throughout the race. And so I think we finished third here last spring. Uh, we had a shot to win in the, in the fall race. And um, I tried to hook the VHT a little too aggressive on the bottom lane on one of the, one of the later restarts around lap 400 and actually spun out while leading. I felt, uh, felt pretty low after that moment. And that's, that's uh, the thing that you have to learn from and adjust to and, and come back the next time around and apply a, a strategy that will help us get to victory lane. So, you know, with everybody on the team on the 41 car, we, we couldn't wait to get to this portion of the season. Um, the way that Daytona turned out with the win, you know, everything's so exciting. It's so big. It's winning a championship in reverse. And, and we had a fog around us for a little bit. And then it was nice to have an off weekend to reset and to get to the short track portion of the season, as well as mix in Talladega uh, coming up in three weeks where we won the last restrictor plate race uh, of so far this year. So looking good, looking good on this part of the season and um, everything that's uh, ahead of us immediately. All right, we'll open up to questions. We'll start here with Jeff and then we'll go to Dustin and Bob. Jeff Gluck from jeffgluck.com. Kurt, I'm wondering, since it's supposed to rain most of the weekend, how do you know how much you'll be able to trust the VHT? Like, will, do you have any concept of how much grip it will retain when it's wet? Yeah, as far as the VHT, I mean, Bristol is, is a perfect place to apply it to uh, because of the concrete and the fact that they have the drag strip out in the, in the backyard here. And, the way a VHT works, it has to be dry, um, and if it's applied properly, which I assume it will be, it, it, that water won't get underneath it or there won't be any type of moisture issues with it. Um, but yes, it's tough to trust. It's tough to predict because we don't run on it all that much. And a track like Bristol, you need to rub it in, it needs to get groomed in, and with the lack that, of practice time we might have, it might not be as consistent as we want it to be. So you gotta just ease into it. Uh, you can't quite trust it right away. It's the same thing as the outside groove. Uh, when you're right up against the wall, you can't go there right away. You have to have uh, some of the Xfinity rubber um, lay down and groom in the outside as well. So this is a, a perfect style of track to think about when you're a dirt racer. It's not ready to go right away. Uh, you gotta pack the track a little bit. You gotta groom in the different grooves and then it's going to change once you get into the race and uh, go into its optimum performance level. Um, and so it, dirt track racers will love this type of weekend. And then the track can dry so quickly here. So you got to be ready when, uh, when there's a practice session that might have rain go through it. And then it can dry and you can be right back out there. Yeah, Texas, much more treacherous on a repave and a, a conservative tire from Goodyear. And for here, we all have laps, we have experience, and so it'll come in quicker. But yes, it's the same mentality. You can't just go 100% after it right away. We'll go to Dustin, Bob, and then Woody. Dustin Long, NBC Sports. Uh, Kurt, last time at a short track, we saw a stage racing where Ricky Stenhouse bumped Kyle out of the way at the end of a stage um, to get his lap back. How much does that open everybody's eyes? How much does that become something that maybe you have to kind of consider because there's the known caution uh, if you're in the lead and running around lap traffic or if you're in a position of uh, needing to get that lap back, how much more did that open everybody's eyes and kind of be, you know, get in the back of your head of, of an option now 
for drivers in this situation. Yeah, I think the, that moment at Martinsville is a perfect definition to the stage racing. It, um, it creates opportunities for uh, many different things to happen, whether you're a lapped car or you're the leader. Um, short tracks, super speedways, road courses, those are the three types of tracks that I thought would be impacted the most by stage racing. Uh, the mile and a half, we get a bit spread out. And yet, there's still certain things that you do uh, because certain mile and a half chew up the tires big time compared to other mile and a half tracks. And so the, the pitch strategy still gets sprinkled in. I think what happened in Martinsville is a perfect definition of what the stage racing was meant to do. Uh, Bob Hocker, CSPN. Um, with the Indy 500 being your first Indy car race a few years ago, do you have any advice for Fernando Alonso? And was there anything that the Andretti's did that you felt specifically helped you kind of acclimate to that race quickly? Um, I, I don't have much advice for a Formula One world champion. I, I think he'll be perfect for the situation. Uh, I think he'll do really well. He's a racer. I think he gets it. Uh, it's a perfect time in his career to make the attempt at the Indy 500 without having any other uh, oval type experience that we know of. Um, he'll prepare well. I saw that there was a test session for um, May 3rd, uh, which is more like a rookie orientation. And the Andretti group will do a fantastic job for him. Uh, they treated me really well with the respect of my background. They'll do that with his. And the thing that, that blew me away still is, um, and I guess that would be my advice to Alonzo, it's hard to prepare, but for the month of May and the amount of times you're on track, grandstands are empty, and then you come out there Sunday morning and you feel the Indiana natives respect for their track and it's their world stage that they're standing on for the day, uh, it's impressive to be there on Memorial Day Sunday at Indianapolis. So that'd be my advice. It's hard to get, uh, used to that amount of people and the amount of pageantry and uh, the, the celebration that's going on Sunday morning. All right, we'll go to Woody, Mark, and then Jerry and Joe. Hey, Kurt, along those lines with all the talk about Alonzo doing the, the Indy 500, are there guys that you think could move the needle like that if they came to NASCAR? And why is it so difficult for that transition to happen? Because it's been hit or miss. Uh, you know, I'd love to see a guy like Marco Andretti come and run Daytona. I think that that would be a huge event uh, for him, for our sport. Um, it's, it's tough for our cars, though, because they're so big and they're so heavy. They move around so much. And so go to a track uh, that either A is, is what you're used to, which is a road course, or B, where the driver has the least amount to um, have to learn or to conquer or to, to I guess the key word is master. I mean, it, I can't master an Indy car in one race. Fernando Alonso has a better chance of doing that. Um, you know, Alexander Rossi, the kid, uh, won the Indy 500 last year. Did he master the car? No, but he mastered enough of uh, the, the certain sequences it takes. And I think Marco would do real well at a Daytona style track because he loves the draft and he loves to be around other cars. So that's, that's what I would think would work the best. Uh, Mark Garrow, PRN. Kurt, good morning. Last year at, at Richmond, we had the little bump and run at the end to win the race on the uh, final lap. And it seems like everybody kind of made that a, a big deal, my opinion, bigger than, than really needed. Back in the day, it didn't seem like that was uh, unacceptable. And do you feel like that is unacceptable now, or is, is it still acceptable to win a race that way, to kind of jam a guy a little bit on a short track, as long as you don't put him in the fence? You hit it on the head right there at the end when you say, as long as you don't put him in the fence or he still continues on to finish second and doesn't lose too many spots, so to speak. It's crazy. I mean, we can all go to road courses, which are almost the hottest ticket to get right now, Sonoma and Watkins Glen, because there's so much beating, banging, thrashing, and the way I grew up watching races is that road courses had a little bit more of a gentleman's agreement. So they flip-flopped. And then to your point, a bump and run and then the chaos that ensued from everybody talking about was that proper or the etiquette. 
And the way that all event turned out, it was just a simple bump and run at a short track. I mean, we all grew up with that. It's just kind of funny how certain things flip-flop and how certain things are digested now. As a follow-up, when, when do you think that changed to where it became, that was a non-crime and now, now it's at least a misdemeanor, if not a felony? <laughs> I, I don't know. Uh, it, it's been, it's been a, a fun journey on the road courses each year we go on how much is uh, accepted and tolerated. And then as, as the short track racing has pretty much stayed the same. I mean, as much as we've evolved, I like the short track racing. Um, I don't know when it changed or when that perception swapped around, but you know, everybody's got stronger opinions nowadays with uh, chat boards and social media. And so when you have, you know, a motorsports writer talking about a certain event, that's great. But when you have uh, millions of people talking about it, bantering back and forth, that's great as well. We'll go to Jerry, Joe, and then to Tucker. Jerry Jordan, KickingTheTires.net and PRN. Have you come down from the high of winning the 500, and how is the Earl World Tour going? <laughs> yeah, I definitely had to, to come back down off that high. It, I relished in that victory and the team and just Tony Gibson's emotions from that and everybody at Stuart Haas. With Tony Stewart winning his first 500 as an owner, Gene Haas, uh, that was one of the last trophies he wanted to put in. His, uh, well, it's not one of the last, it's one of the ones he wanted to get the most uh, because we still have so many more to get. And yeah, the, the trophy, I dropped it off with the crew guys before the week, uh, the off week started. So I've yet to check back in with where it is, who has it and where it's been. Uh, but it's been a lot of fun to um, have the trophy and to take it all around and, and to do fun things with it. So I, I have to give an update on where's Earl because I don't even know where Earl is. Joe Menzer, FoxSports.com. Uh, Kurt, having had so much success here very early in your career, I know the track has changed and all that, but are you kind of surprised that you haven't, uh, I mean, haven't come so close so many other times, you haven't won again here? It's uh, definitely gotten tougher uh, with the amount of options there are with the low lane, the high lane, uh, the way that the tires have changed you know, the, the races that I won had a nice consistent pattern. It was to be a bulldog on the bottom lane, move guys out of the way, and, you know, let the, let the rough edges drag. The new Bristol and where we are now, it's a little bit more finesse, and you have to find the lane that works the best to be able to get by the guy that's already in the best lane, and you can't necessarily just move them because we're all on that ragged edge that close. That, that high lane, we're all up there running that 15 second lap time and you're right on the edge of slipping already. And so you're trying to get to the guy and move him. And yet if you do one little extra step, you're gonna slide up into the fence. And it's such a large consequence when that happens. So there's, it's just a different way of going about it. And I haven't quite uh, mastered it like I did before. And again, third, third last spring here and uh, just trying to build off of that. All right, we're going to go to Tucker, to the middle, and then to Kelly. Uh, Tucker White, SpeedwayMedia.com. Uh, Kurt, given that the uh, VHT is basically, re we're using the VHT to restore the bottom groove here at Bristol, wouldn't it make more sense to just do away with the progressive banking and restore non-variable 36-degree banking here at Bristol like we had back when you were dominating here? Uh, we're, we're not just going to go dig up Augusta, Georgia, uh, because the golfers didn't like the new tee boxes. Um, you know, you have to adjust to the millions of dollars that Bristol Motor Speedway invested into the track's new surface, and we're trying to find that right combination. And I think it'd be easier to work with lighter race cars, cars that didn't have to carry as much weight that we do in them, and work with a tire that um, will give it the raw speed right away and then drop off. And if a yellow comes out and the tires cool off, the tires shouldn't grip as good as guys that pit and put on new tires. That's what we want to see. We want to see a, a tire that will have a ton of speed when they're fresh and drop off no matter what. And when you have that, that's when you have the opportunity for guys to come in and pit, grab those fresh tires, and then charge back up through there and look at that cool racing of cars side by side and moving forward, moving backward. So I, I like the attempt with the VHT but you can tell they're in the direction of trying to find grip. 
Well, what does that mean? We should just have a, a tire that would have more grip. Kurt, Mike Lucas, uh, WCYB TV. Kurt, what makes Bristol so much different than the other racetracks on the circuit? Ah, uh, just just look at it. You know, it's there's no other track that's this size that has this much banking uh, that uh, holds this many people. I mean, it was. Uh, something where you can look at the wall and see the, the picture of the track from the, the 70s and 80s, and it already looked cool then on, on how different it was then. And now with the asphalt uh, changing to concrete over the years, uh, grandstands being built every year we came back here, uh, it's, it's definitely one of the most unique places. And I always tell people, you know, if you've never been to a NASCAR race, you don't start out at the Daytona 500. You know, you don't start out at Indianapolis Charlotte is a great place to come and see the heritage of our sport. And if you really want to see the true uh, short track of how our sport found its way up, watching guys like Dale Sr. and Terry Labonte grind it out for wins, and guys like Allison and Yarbrough Petty, they all came here to Bristol. And if you conquered Bristol, it was something special. All right, we're going to wrap up here with Kelly. We can get a microphone to her. KellyCrandallRacer.com. Kurt, two quick things. Um, all this talk about stage racing and what happened in Martinsville. The other thing about Martinsville that stood out is it seemed like the patience level was gone from lap one instead of kind of slowly developing over the course of, of that race. Do you expect more of that this weekend? And, and would you say that's a product of, of stage racing now on a short track? Yeah, it's funny how there's 500 laps that are posted for the total distance. And yet with the stage racing, we've all gone into the mindset of three separate races. And yes, I mean, I would assume that this would be more of the same. Uh, we'll see how the practice sessions go uh, with the rain and the amount of consistency within the track. And if it's ready to go right, hard right away, yeah, guys are gonna go hard and try to race for that uh, stage win and get those points. And I, I don't see anything different here than what we saw at Martinsville. And second, in your opening, you talked about how you're ex you and the team are excited to get to this portion of the schedule. You have a lot of good tracks coming up. Um, have you kind of was the off weekend good in a sense for the team to kind of shake off the last couple weeks? It seemed like you guys were fighting some some gremlins with with I think for a few weeks there you had like some electrical issues, kind of back to back, and things just haven't gone as smooth as you would hope. So are you are you confident though that things will now trend back up? Um, being at this portion of the schedule that you really like? Yeah, I'm confident in it. Uh, I mean, we've got three top tens so far this year out of seven races. It's not bad to finish in the top ten half the time, but that's not a championship effort. You know, we know we can do better. And the uh, alternator issues were a complete surprise to all of us, uh, especially on the 41. We kept having them, and it was a small little gremlin that we finally found that we did a little different than the other SHR cars that did it different than some of the um, you know, Yates powered, Ford powered cars. So yeah, now we're to the short tracks. Uh, aerodynamics go out the window for a few weeks. Uh, even Talladega, we've built one of the best replicas we could build of our Daytona 500 winning car. Uh, that's, that's one of the coolest things and one of the toughest things. You win a race and then you don't get the car back for a year. <laughs> it's like it's extinct but yet it's one of the coolest cars that you've ever had. So uh, we've built a really good car for Talladega, and here we're at the short track, and then we'll go out to Kansas and double check on the mile and a half stuff that we've worked on back at the shop here in a few weeks. And we're actually gonna get one more question in over here from Al. Hey, Mike. Hey, Curtis, Al Pierce from Auto Week. At Daytona Beach in February, Junior told us, he said, this can take me a while to get back into the groove and he said, the other drivers will probably know that I'm back quicker than the fans will, because you all see things that we don't see. Does Junior appear to be back, I mean, even after missing so much, does he seem to be back where he was when he left last year? You know, my, my little brother was out for 11 races, I think, in 2015. And you could see a little bit of the rust the first couple weeks. And I think we all saw that with Junior the first couple weeks, but by Vegas, and especially what we did at Texas last week, I mean, he's back. I mean, he, but yes, there are things that you need to do personally, and then there's things that the sport has done while you were gone, uh, because there's notes that we have from nine months ago that we look at and we kind of giggle like, oh, wow, we ran that setup. We haven't done something like that in a long time. And 
for him to take off a half a season, yes, there's, there's things he needed to do, but also the team was evolving and he needed to adapt to those setups as well as what he needed to do personally. So I, yeah, you're right. We see things on track and he was making moves at Texas. I'm like, yeah, he's back. Kurt, thanks for joining us this morning and good luck this weekend. All right, great, thank you.